the design convo podcast hey everybody welcome 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 to the design convo podcast where we interact with creative individuals from the design industry to learn the things that otherwise might be a bit difficult to understand especially when you're starting as designers the show will be the space where we ask questions that might sound silly but make a huge difference in our lives i'm your host shakti hari and i'm going to ask these questions on everyone's behalf i'm feeling great today for this episode we have sneha sankar joining us as our guest Sneha is a brand experience designer, an art director, an illustrator, and a typography enthusiast. She has co-founded the design consulting firm Prophecy, an innovation strategy and design consultancy focused on building digital products and brands. Sneha also teaches brand experience design with the 10K Designers Community Platform. She has experience in designing for tech firms like Ola, an academy, and has done art direction for a number of projects for various brands. Please join me in welcoming Sneha Sankar, who is also known as Sneha Sanks on the internet. Welcome to the show, Sneha. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Shakti. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that was a very, very generous <laughs> and uh, well-researched uh, introduction. Thank you. Can you please, uh, you know, take us through what and how shaped yourself as an artist and or a designer that you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, I think like, you know, I've always thought about this. I want to start by actually sharing this fact that it's a realization that I've had in the last couple of years that mm-hmm. everyone, firstly, like as a, when you're around 17 years old, you are asked to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. And mm-hmm. it's a really difficult decision to make as a teenager. Uh, in fact, I would say even as an adult, it's a difficult decision to make, but as a teenager it's much harder and the more and more we the we kind of the we progress with the world like the kind of options and access to information and 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 the internet and all of these things that we have this decision just gets harder and harder because you you have the the um the difficulty of choice right and a choice yeah. is an amazing thing but it can also be a real uh, bane uh, so but i think that i've been what i my realization has been is that in the last couple of years is that i've been quite fortunate to uh throughout my life like from when i've had to make the decision about what i want to do for the rest of my life uh i've been quite fortunate to first mm-hmm. there are a few things one is know what you want to do second mm-hmm. is get to do what you want to do have the like you know the resources the abilities like the the skills but also the the privilege the resources money time uh whatever uh, physical cap- capabilities mental capabilities a lot of different things uh then get to do it in in like study it and and get to kind of learn it from a place that is extremely um reputed and uh, well known and it has a history of its own we'll talk about that uh, I'll, i'll talk about that a little later mm-hmm. and then get to do it every day and then still enjoy it and at the obviously the best the, the cherry on top is people get to pay people pay you for it and you you get to do what you love and people are happy to pay you money to do that every day and yeah. what i what i guess when i was younger i just assumed that a lot of people have a similar kind of like i didn't think too much of it it didn't feel mm-hmm. especially um unique but the more i kind of uh, meet new people and kind of grow up even my own friends and family and things like that i realized that it's a real it's a genuine privilege and a blessing that for see yeah that i that i know what i want to do and i genuinely enjoy doing it and uh, yeah and 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 that's what i get to do so so yeah so to answer your question i think that growing up i've always kind of um been like i've always been interested in like the arts um we used uh, like my sister and i used to sing when we were growing up uh but we always like apart from dance i was never really into dance but like i used to draw i used to paint i used to like any kind of any activity that involved like using uh my hands and and kind of getting really deep into the details and involved in making something as the act of creating something so uh yeah so that's how so when i was in school i used to really enjoy like 
making charts and stuff that we used to have to like every month the a section a different section in that particular grade would be in charge of the the corridor the school board so you'd get to decide like the theme and you get to like you know figure out i mean technically it's art direction what that is yeah, but yeah. Uh, i mean i didn't know that back then uh yeah but you get to decide what the theme is you get to decide what the you know what the overall story is and how things are who will do what and how it overall looks so i used to love the planning of that the actual putting together of it and i used to get really involved and like deeply invested in like the titles and like writing all of the text and everything in that yeah again back then i didn't know that was typography and it was about it's like lettering i just enjoyed doing it a lot so i would mm-hmm. go to like dafont.com find the coolest looking a uh, thing at that point something that was really very jazzy and try to replicate that so i used mm-hmm. to uh, like type out the letters and then draw that uh, draw those letters individually and i used to really into it like i used to really enjoy it and of course people a lot of people weren't doing that back then i don't know how i found it i don't know how it happened but it did and like people used to appreciate it a lot uh that it looked very people used to keep saying it looks printed and i never understood mm-hmm. what that meant but i just enjoyed doing it and uh, yeah silly things like i used to love drawing like bio diagrams i used to draw diagrams for my sister as well she really didn't enjoy di- drawing diagrams so i used to draw hers as well um mm-hmm. yeah it wasn't i didn't take to art because i didn't like something else uh, in in fact i enjoyed math i enjoyed science i enjoyed like uh, i i just liked like learning and doing uh, lots of different things but um, mm-hmm. yeah i guess i also played a lot of sports so i guess i mean the hallmark of my growing up was that i was i wanted my my day to be as colorful as possible i wanted to do as many different things as possible um it brought me a lot of happiness and satisfaction to you know to play sports to do art to like to also like do my work and and i had friends and like i i just had a really jam packed uh, childhood but without like with no resentment like it wasn't bad or wasn't i wasn't like uh pressured or anything like that i just enjoyed that a lot um so i okay. guess the the overall the culmination of that i think is is what kind of drew me to a profession that is creative so to say um yeah that's what i'd like to think yeah wow that's pretty amazing you have been an art director your whole life i know that that was just there <laughs> thanks thanks for sharing this story sneha uh yeah. you know i have a follow up question so uh when you said you have been uh, you know doing this all your life you have a formal education in design from nid yeah you know which is one of the best design schools in india the question is yeah. uh, do you think in today's world a formal education in design is important to be successful or do you think it's an advantage it's definitely an advantage uh, i would not it's not a yes or no answer and it's like is it required is it not required i would never say yes or no it's very mm-hmm. circumstantial it's very dependent on the kind of person you are but also the kind of expectations you have from an education uh, a few things one is that a formal education kind of it puts a it puts a good kind of framework for you to know what to learn uh, when mm-hmm. you're learning on your own there is an abundance of like learning material and content that's available online and in many cases it's much richer than what you might get in a formal education uh, mm-hmm. but the 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 advantage or the the kind of benefit that you get in a formal education is that someone kind of creates that map for you and having that map is really really uh, important sometimes if you are the kind of person who a, either doesn't need a map who is kind of just wants to go with the flow and doesn't like you know benefit from having a uh, you know a path uh, or if you're the kind of person who can create a map for yourself then i i i imagine that a formal education may not benefit you that much and and the assumptions that i'm making here is that the the formal education in terms of quality is comparative to the quality of learning content that you get say online or from other people from any kind of self teaching kind of atmosphere so mm-hmm. that's a big assumption that i'm making um and yeah so that's one thing the other thing about advantage is that 
yeah let's be honest like colleges and and like university and all of that they really help you get a foot in the door there's a certain reputation that gets attached to your name for better or for worse um and it helps a lot in the initial uh years of your of your career it helps if not for your entire career it helps for like making that first big move uh so whether that is your first job or like your first freelance opportunity or the first uh invoice that you are able to charge somebody i think in most cases having a, a design like a formal education in design uh might allow you to charge more purely because people like know where you studied and they know about that place and there's a certain expectation that they correspond with that now whether or not that is true or whether or not that is fair or valid is completely separate uh as is with most things in the world there are brilliant people that come out of nid there are mediocre people that come out of nid there are mediocre people who don't go to nid there are brilliant people that don't and i mean this is true for all colleges and all universities i think it's more yeah. about the yeah so one is so then third thing is about the experience itself uh the experience of being in a college uh in a university in a in a very like informative years of of uh, one's life um all colleges are not made the same all college experiences are not made the same uh however in my case i think that uh, again nid had like my experience at nid was was good and bad in many cases but it was really important like um many of the friends that i have today i have for life that i made at nid you know and similarly like the the network that you're able to uh, cultivate um the fact that tomorrow if i need to hire somebody i know who to call even to mm-hmm. ask where i should kind of look for people to hire or if i want a job there is already um a ready made kind of network available to me of people i can who who already trust me to a certain extent uh these are big advantages so yeah so three things one is the map the second is the advantages that other people like the perception that other people have and the advantages that uh that you know allows you then the advantages of a network uh and finally is the the experience the college experience itself uh mm-hmm. so these are things that are they're outside of education so to say it's less about like design education or like learning the actual practice or skills of design but more about how it how it uh, cultivates your personality and how it 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 uh, make what kind of designer it makes you uh, mm-hmm. so yeah yeah so when you say uh, you learn all these things have a road map in front of you when you step into design colleges right and uh, I don't know about uh, what happens in design school but as far as engineering schools are considered you need to unlearn the things which you learn in college especially when it comes to the technical knowledge that you gain out of it so what about design yeah. uh, schools so do, is it the same or does it differ yeah so i mean much like engineering there are a lot of uh, skills and practices that are ever evolving right uh, even in mm-hmm. design uh in terms of the tools that we learn the techniques even like maybe even trends or things like that and design schools are extremely bad at at adapting and evolving their curriculum to kind of match the the uh, changing needs of the industry um when you grad when i graduated out of nid or a typical graduate that comes out okay i'm also i just want to speak just for nid in this case i'm not sure about what it might be like in other schools but i mm-hmm. speak from personal experience uh so when you come out of nid the the uh there is a huge gap between what you learn and what you expect the industry to be and what kind of a role and um yeah role and place you have in the industry versus what the industry requires you to kind of uh be what it needs uh not just in terms of skills but also in terms of like your flexibility your adaptability as a person um your your ability to work with non designers that's something that we don't learn at all uh in nid right um the entire school is full of designers including the faculty including 
uh, even if it's from other you know disciplines but you're still working with people who understand the general language and vocabulary that you that you share but in mm-hmm. the real world people don't like they don't care <laughs> and uh, uh and they don't know and half the job in in the industry is explaining explaining to people the kind of value and the kind of um yeah the kind of role that you can play and and the how you can collaborate with them and how you can help them right um mm-hmm. so yeah so i think design schools like there is a bunch of unlearning that is required uh as part of you know graduating and starting at your first job and everything and people who are a little too rigid and too kind of stuck to what they learned at design school probably find it difficult uh to to adapt uh sometimes the the result of that sometimes is that they choose to work in places where there are other other like alumni or seniors from their college so again there is a smoother transition it feels less jarring and things like that but mm-hmm. yeah and also so yeah so it's the the in terms of the skills and the knowledge and all of that the evolve the techniques and everything yes it's definitely dated um uh, for example at nid that as far as i graduated in 2018 um till then um i had never firstly till after i graduated i joined the uh, an academy but at, before that i had never heard of the word startup in my life like i never mm-hmm. heard the word uh i had never in nid we had one course that was about like ui ux design uh it was a very uh like it was a very short course and kind of very superficial so i mean for an entire industry that is so uh there's so much of what we do right now that is tech focused and digital focused and nid doesn't have a dedicated program to digital design at all uh, at the undergraduate level they have it at postgraduate but like some of the like it's it feels kind of ridiculous that um as a graphic designer or as a product designer graduating out of nid you actually you just do one like two week course uh to learn about how to de- design for digital products and then when you go out into the real world uh, that's all that people expect from you and you have to kind of learn it almost um, from scratch uh, so that's yeah that's like one example of that but it yeah. happens quite often there are some good things in the sense that i don't know if this is true for engineering but in design school like learning about design theory uh design history and all of that uh is not inherently uh, is not immediately beneficial but it's like one of those things that you keep you kind of keep as part of you and ca- as part of your practice for the long term and it really helps a lot so some of those things i would not replace uh, i would not replace the immediate requirements of the industry for uh like i would not swap these like i don't think that they like one should be removed and the other one should be replaced uh with this but i do think that there is there is space and room to kind of include a uh, more uh modern and and more present day kind of industry requirements or skills that are actually useful in the real world yeah. plus some amount of uh, design theory critical thinking things like that which aren't immediately actionable but uh, are extremely useful skills as a designer yeah when i went through your profile i noticed that you did a design mba course pretty recently right so what, what is it about and why did you take it i could this yeah. connects with what you just answered yeah yeah so uh so ever since i i started working i start, i've been working until recently i've been working at product startups and mm-hmm. uh the role i've kind of taken on uh at both an academy as well as graphy i was at ola for a very brief period of time but mostly at mm-hmm. an academy and graphy i've played this kind of a role where uh my team is like a centralized design team that facilitates and kind of supports all other functions in the organization with design so similar to how an agency like an like an in-house agency of sorts so let's say the sales team had a certain requirement in terms of like they they're finding it difficult to communicate 
uh, or pitch a certain new product, right? So they come to my team and they are like, okay, this is our problem. And then we kind of help them pin down the problem, create a brief out of that, and then figure out what might be the best solution uh, from a mm-hmm. design lens. And we kind of collaborate with them on that. So I've always kind of been at this uh, place where I was working adjacent to a lot of uh, roles that were very different from uh, my own. I would very rarely work, apart from my own team, we would never work with other designers. We would work with business teams, sales teams, product teams, marketing, things like that. And I, I figured that rather than, one is of course, a big part of my job, like I mentioned before, was to communicate with people and, and make them understand how we can help them and, uh, you know, kind of show them something to understand. Uh, like people have a certain perception of what design is and they kind of uh, think about it from a very superficial and kind of very tactical point of view. But design can help them in a lot of much deeper ways to even uncover the problem itself but to really really empathize with uh, their problem and to really understand and help them I felt like it was important for me to kind of become a little familiar with certain uh, terminology certain uh, practices in business and and, and in those you know in business fields um, that again I did not I I don't have uh, experience with Um, also I think that Again, I don't, I don't want to generalize, but like after school, like when I went to design mm-hmm. school, it's like you completely forgot and completely detached from any kind of mathematics or any kind of arithmetic or anything that required um, calculation of any sorts or uh, quantitative thinking. Uh, design requires you to think very qual- qualitatively. Uh, even when you're doing user research or your design, you're doing persona, like you're creating personas or you're doing competitor analysis or whatever. All of that is qualitative uh, studies. And we very rarely do like market analysis or like uh, calculating numbers uh, or to do any kind of number-based problem solving, right? Or even problem uncovering. So... These were the, this was the premise with which I wanted to kind of, as looking for a program uh, or any kind of, um, not necessarily a course, I was even reading some books that helped, uh, you know, with the same. And that's how I found some articles uh, written by Alan, who is, who is the uh, founder of uh, Design MBA, uh, DMBA. Mm-hmm. And um, then I came across this course and it was designed very, very focused specifically for designers who wanted to build business empathy as they call it so it's a very uh introductory course in the sense that like you're not it's not, not like a real mba or like you're not going to come out of there feeling like you can replace a business person uh but when say a business like someone from a business team talks about uh certain certain terminology or like certain concepts that are difficult uh for us to grasp um, in terms of, let's say, what is the what is the business model that we should, you know, uh, use for this particular new feature or this product or something like that. So we became we kind of became familiar with the kinds of business models that exist in the world. What are the pros and cons of them? Using some case studies, uh, like Spotify has a freemium model. Why do they have a freemium model? Uh, when are subscription models better? Why are they better in some situations? Why are they bad? things like that. Um, also, another extremely useful module in the in the program was uh, prototyping uh, with numbers. And basically, it's this idea of like design, I mean, prototyping is a big part of the design process and kind of validating your design uh, ideas and things like concepts. But there was this uh, module which kind of helped you do that with numbers so very useful example uh, and case study that I kind of took out of it is so every new designer whenever they join especially brand designers when they join a new company they kind of want to do a rebrand like they're just like we should rebrand or a product similarly a product designer joins a new team and they're like we should create a design system and it's very easy to say that 
but it's very very difficult to convince other stakeholders that this is a meaningful exercise right so yeah. uh, one of the exercises that we did as part of the uh, program uh, and i think there's a blog post that's there online about this as well which kind of helps you calculate uh, correspond the number of man hours into how much time it would take to create a design system and how much time the design system would save uh the team of designers and using those numbers that calculation basically allow proving that um you will effectively save money if you dedicate mm -hmm. one or two designers to focus on a design system for say x amount of time mm -hmm. putting in that time and work and kind of uh, dedicating them taking them away from ongoing projects in the mm -hmm. long term will benefit you uh, will be more cost effective than having the team of designers create uh components and stuff like that ad hoc uh mm -hmm. because it wastes a lot more time similarly even for rebrands and things like that if you spend a certain amount of time uh figuring out your guidelines figuring out all of the different assets and you know consolidating a lot of disparate uh things um uh, mm -hmm. even though that immediately seems like a waste of time in the long term you can actually prove that it saves you money and it saves you time uh so and using only numbers so if you had to make a a case for this with like a manager or like you know even a design manager but even like like let's say a product stakeholder or like a business stakeholder they kind of relate a lot of times with numbers rather than like you know this is good for our company or like this will help our brand these are very abstract ideas that a lot of non designers don't um relate with uh and and they don't amount to very much right so if you take numbers to them and actually prove to them that you know this saves us money saves the company money in this this way uh it's very mm -hmm. beneficial so yeah so that was one of the very interesting uh modules from the program uh yeah i learned a lot of interesting uh ideas i don't use it on a day to day basis like my learnings i don't kind of uh, need it all the time but it's the kind of thing that when i do need it i am able to kind of tap into and recall and uh, it helps uh you know make a case for certain things a little better um yeah it was it was it was quite good yeah i enjoyed the program that yeah, that's pretty detailed thanks for sharing that uh, yeah. i know since we talked about design systems and uh, having centralized and decentralized design teams Uh, what do you think would yeah. be the ideal way to uh, structure a design team so we have a centralized system we have a decentralized system some even have you know a diamond structure where the teams are like internally split so what do you think is the ideal way to do it so i think that it's very much dependent on the requirement of the company but also the scale of the company i think mm -hmm. that uh definitely at early stages of the company uh my my recommendation from personal experience is that a central design team is extremely beneficial because it keeps a lot of the it keeps the design team tight uh, like they kind of uh, are it feels like being in a team where everyone is sparring with each other everyone is learning from each other a lot of um, differently capable people like they have different skills but they kind of helping each other make their skills better they learning some adjacent skills so for example at graphy we had one centralized design team but mm -hmm. i was leading the brand efforts and my colleague abhishek he was leading the product efforts but we had one team so like the motion designers for example the animators they would work on micro interactions they would also work on brand films so when they did that they would have very consistent kind of thinking across these these spaces and mm -hmm. um and, and they would understand that they would get to they would be able to give a very full picture to the end user see at the end of the day the end user doesn't care or doesn't know whether this is the brand or this is the product or this is social media or this is marketing they don't care they just see one experience and yeah. they are just focused on that experience being good uh now whether that was designed by a product designer whether that was designed by a brand designer it does not make a difference it just needs to be consistent and good right so yeah. if you're able to give the end user a consistent cohesive well-rounded experience um especially at an early stage where you're building 
just your building recall for your brand for your product your your kind of uh, onboarding people and things like that uh, mm-hmm. having a centralized design team is usually quite um, is quite beneficial uh, mm-hmm. it uh, it helps it also helps the other teams kind of understand the value of design because it's coming from one place and uh, you have it is you, it, then it becomes important that the design team becomes accessible to different teams that's yeah. the challenge with centralized teams that you should have one or more people from the team whose entire job is it is to um, be very good communicators articulate your uh, team's value and kind of um, help the you know the other teams create good briefs things like that but if you don't have that then it becomes like a silo that's not good either so if you have that in a central centralized design team then uh, that in an early stage is, is great early to mid stage i would say as the okay. as the company grows as you scale uh, like to over 500 employees and things like that then having a centralized design team becomes more challenging i still think that you can do it if you have mm-hmm. more such design managers and kind of people who are uh, who serve as the touch point between the uh, team that is external and the design team so this person basically serves as like a liaison like a translator like a someone who is able to understand what the problem is uh, and communicate that effectively to the design team and also help communicate that back to the respective stakeholder so yeah so that's a centralized design team decentralized i think that uh, once uh, once the team scale a lot uh, even though it would be really nice to have a single design team because um, designers learn a lot from each other uh, of course designers learn a lot from others as well uh, but uh, distributed teams sometimes have the uh, the 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 cons of of being kind of the silo problem again where like the each of those teams work in their own silos with their own respective business heads or product heads or whatever and they're very very focused on their uh their kpi or like their um uh, import whatever they're responsible for and they kind of it doesn't allow for them to think big picture or to think about the entire brand or the entire experience because different parts of the experience different parts of the brand are being handled by different people who are not talking to each other uh so yeah so i think that in both cases communication becomes super important uh but um, uh distributed teams become like a much more uh practical solution when you have really big teams uh but i think that the caveat there also is that um, communication is important there should still be a custodian for the product or for the brand in the sense that even if these teams are distributed um mm-hmm. there there are these like you mentioned the diamond structure i think spotify has an interesting structure where they report to a certain like a business manager but they get feedback and stuff from like a design uh, manager so those mm-hmm. are quite beneficial because then it improves the quality of the design and you're getting meaningful uh feedback but at the same time you're also uh working with the stakeholders that actually need your design solution and and yeah so that structure is also helpful where it's um distri- semi distributed like i think in spotify it's called like pods and something else i can't remember but yeah spotify has this dual structure going on uh now okay. yeah, that's pretty cool too yeah I'll definitely go back and look into that. I'll, I'll, yeah. Thanks for sharing this, uh, Sneha. You know something, something off this topic. What are your hobbies? What do you do when you're not designing? Oh, I love to cook. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. a big uh, foodie. Um, I love trying out new recipes. I love. I cook very like I like to cook really slowly. I cut like all my vegetables. Take like a long time, and then I. it's a like therapeutic um i make a dish that's really elaborate that might take a couple of hours i just really enjoy my myself uh i have two cats they are um, very entertaining uh they i think i i feel like spending time with them counts as a hobby uh 
I also, like I mentioned, I uh, I enjoy music. I like, uh, I don't sing so much anymore, but I do enjoy singing, uh, finding new music, listening to new music. Um, yeah, uh, I also used to play a lot of sports. I really like playing cricket, playing basketball. Uh, I don't do it so much anymore, unfortunately, but um, nowadays I, I box <laughs> on the weekends. I like boxing. Uh, that's All quite right. fun. Yeah, so yeah, I guess those would be like my hobbies. All right, that is a long list. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, one interesting question, Sneha. So financial freedom is something every designer or an artist dream about, right? So how do you think a designer should plan and manage his or her streams of income? Okay, what? How would you? How would you define financial freedom? Uh, I'm I'm curious to know what what you mean exactly by that. All right. So uh, my thought on that is that when I when I'm able to do something that I love to do without having to look for, uh, you know, bringing bread to the family or my plate on a daily okay. basis, that would be my financial okay. freedom. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. Okay. Cool. So yeah, a couple of things. I think that uh, one is that, like I mentioned in the beginning, if you're, mm-hmm. um, I don't think it's always a good thing. In my case, it is, it's been quite a good thing that, you mm-hmm. know, like this, the Venn diagram of like, what you love to do, what you're good at, and what people will pay you money for this that Ikigai Venn diagram. Um, yeah. mine is quite overlapped and that's pretty good but I don't think that you always need to find the thing that you the thing that brings you money to be the thing that you love to do I think that they yeah. can be separate things sometimes in fact the things that bring you joy and the things that you love to do if you add a financial component to it it makes it less enjoyable sometimes um mm-hmm there's a certain kind of expectation that you have from that activity uh, because you've attached money to it now and it becomes less enjoyable sometimes. So I think that financial freedom, uh, how I see it would be that first I would say to try to define exactly what it means to you, right? Like, is it important for you to find the thing that brings you joy that you're good at and that brings you money is it important that they're all the same thing uh because i don't think that's true in everyone's case uh, so you need to kind of figure out whether you're the kind of person that you want that to be the same if it's mm-hmm. not the same then you want to find out what are these three things um and how you can kind of split your your time or how you can split your um uh, efforts your energy uh, across these three things such that you're not compromising on any of the three things because yeah. many a time uh for example i've always wanted to uh study uh, culinary arts like i've always wanted to like actually formally like do a course or like something really intensive in cooking but i never mm-hmm. expect to make money out of it i don't want to like be a chef or like i don't want to run uh yeah, I, I don't I, I don't consider that to be a thing that I want to do. And I think that if I go after that kind of goal, it might make food less enjoyable for me. Uh so that's 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 one example. So uh I think that in defining these things becomes really important because I think there's a certain notion that it should be like this, but I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, in terms of income sources, uh, I think there are lots of different kinds of income sources in the world. Um, the most uh, uh, cliche but useful piece of advice is to not link time to money uh, because time is limited. Um, everyone has the same amount of time in a day. And if you want to uh, increase the amount of money that you earn, uh, it's it would it won't be exponential if it's attached to time uh and there's a certain amount of burnout like there's a certain point that you will reach burnout because uh you're expelling that much energy that much time to bring lots of money so there is some component of uh how you can convert 
the same amount of time but add more value uh, so that can be in the form of creating uh, tools or products or things for other people that bring a long-term value that you create once but that is useful to people for an infinite mm -hmm. period of time yeah. uh, there's also uh, the idea of uh, using money as an investment itself uh, not just time um, like money makes money like let's be honest about that so um, yeah. putting your money in a in a situ in a place that helps you grow it that is also mm -hmm. increasing that all of these things are different modes of kind of helping facilitate your uh, financial freedom so to say um, but in in my experience like i think a lot of the investment like the investment advice or the advice about financial freedom passive income all of these things they come from an extremely limited place of privilege that like a certain kind of person can afford uh, you know uh, a lot of people just don't have free time it's it's just it's very simple like um, i think working from home has helped a lot of people realize that all the time the time that they used to have at office was at least like dedicated time to work and when they come home they have chores they have family they have things errands to run things like that but now these things are getting a lot more mixed together and that's when yeah. you realize that it's very few hours that some people have just to themselves or just to kind of explore alternate sources of income or passive income or things like that so a lot of times this advice about these kinds of things come come from yeah come from uh from men who have a lot of time who don't have uh you know children to take care of or errands to run or um yeah or or families to take care of and things like that and i think that it's very very specific to the person and you kind of have to find your own formula and your own whatever is your your comfort but i do think that uh, uh like everyone has a diff different risk uh, risk component like a, like everyone's risk aversion is different uh, yeah. women have a very very high risk aversion so um yeah but we do have to kind of if it is important to feel more uh free from being be feel more free uh from your money or like your sources of income uh yeah mm -hmm. there there might be creative ways to think about that but uh, yeah i don't feel i don't feel comfortable giving advice because like i don't know uh, what might be helpful to people at the same time um i feel like i'm trying to figure that out myself as well uh yeah so what i would say is to not like my only advice would be to not take advice at face value because <laughs> it's very there's a lot of asterisks uh, attached to it uh, that uh, no one talks much about yeah yeah of course of course it's very subjective yeah Sneha, the upcoming segment is about, you know, your side projects and uh, what you do apart from your regular work. All right. So let's, let's talk about yeah. prophecy. Why and how was it created? Yeah. Yeah. So prophecy is like my main hustle at this point. Uh, I, I am, I don't consider any of my things as side hustles. Uh, mm -hmm. all my, uh, about a year back, uh, starting May, I kind of became I started working independently as a designer. So now I I have the good fortune of kind of like using my time how I see fit. So all all my hustles are main hustles or all our side hustles, however you want to see it. And prophecy essentially is uh, so my my business partners and colleagues uh, Akshay and Siddharth, uh, they were starting uh, they were starting a consultancy. Uh, they both are product designers. Their background is in like product design, strategy, um, and and uh, consulting. So they were um, starting this new consultancy called Prophecy. Uh, I heard about it around Jan of twenty one, and uh, I was at that point uh, like I was at Graphy, and uh, I like I had kind of 
design the graphy brand from zero to one. I really enjoy the zero to one process of creating brands and building startups, especially. Um, and I had a really good run there and it was really enjoyable, but I did feel like um, I kind of want to do this um, at a, a, to do this for multiple different startups and, and industries and domains kind of get really immersed in uh, a certain industry or space, build their brand and then uh, do this, you know, somewhere else. And I felt like that's what I was good at and that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, so I did feel, and I've always kind of wanted to eventually start like my own practice, my own studio consultancy, call it whatever you want. Um, and they were starting Prophecy. So I had a chat with them around Jan. And uh, yeah, and, and the idea with Prophecy was that we were going to start like a design collective. So essentially, we're all like all of the people that join Prophecy are like partners in the business. We all own own parts of the business. No one, we have no employees. Um, no one gets hired. Uh, everyone who comes in is a co-owner. Uh, so that way, if it's sharing profits, if it's making decisions for the consultancy, if it's about bringing in clients, running projects, all of those responsibilities are shared. Uh, each of us kind of comes in with a different domain expertise, uh, sorry, not domain expertise, but design expertise. Uh, for example, uh, Siddharth and Akshay, like I mentioned, product design, their focus is there. Maybe someone else is uh, really focused on research. I am focused on brand. Uh, there'll be someone else who comes in, but we're kind of like um, focused on one thing, but can support each other on ongoing projects in different ways. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if you're familiar with how Pentagram functions, Pentagram also has like partners and they run their own teams. Uh, sometimes they collaborate on projects, sometimes they run projects independently. And each of them has like a different expertise. Some of them are like focused on sound design, some on graphic design, whatever. So similar to that. And the idea was that like, if we're all owners, like the decision-making, the, the overall philosophy is like equitable uh, and there is no like, um, you know, boss and people just get salaries, but like we're kind of figuring out how to uh, make sure that everyone feels valued uh, feels like they are they own prophecy and prophecy is theirs that they don't work for a prophecy so that's the that was the idea and I really liked this approach it was very aligned with uh, what like my eventual goal as well like I was just like in a matter of a couple of years it's something that I wanted to do uh, so when I heard about this it was just like should I consider accelerating my path to kind of try this out sooner than I had in mind it made sense i really liked uh, akshay and siddharth speaking with them it's quite cool so so yeah so that's when i decided to kind of join uh and uh, so it's the three of us uh so far there are a few people who were still kind of speaking to and seeing uh how but like we don't hire people so like when we speak to people it's people who uh would either would be would have been planning to kind of do something like this on their own anyway or they are independent or they uh, kind of reach out to us and even in the interview process or like all of that is kind of like this mutual hiring process where they evaluate us we evaluate them uh, because like, we want to be equals in this um, so yeah so at Prophecy at the moment uh, um, some projects we run like independently uh, like if the client requires just brand expertise, then it's just a brand project. Uh, the scope is a certain uh, duration accordingly. Uh, if ideally the idea also was that we do want to work on more projects that require a holistic approach uh, where we can think about both brand and product. So the experience is very well-rounded and kind of uh, cohesive. So that's the idea. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll get to work on more projects that required our shared expertise. Uh, but um, that's that's it's 
prophecy officially started in Jan 21. So it's been over a year, but I yeah. officially joined in May. So it will be a year in two months. But yeah, it's been good so far. There are pros and cons of this kind of model. Like uh, if, by, by not hiring, there's a certain level of, um, there's only a certain number of projects that we can take on at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm the only brand person. So uh, I just do one project at a time. Uh, and, and like, I'm fully focused on that. Uh, but do we, we do often collaborate with, uh, with independent designers for a certain project and stuff like that. Uh, if we need extra hands or a certain kind of specialized, uh, uh expertise. Um, but yeah, like we, we want to be very conscious about like how we're scaling the company, even if it means that it's slow initially, but it feels purposeful. It feels kind of, um, uh, thoughtful that's that's the idea so yeah all right you know uh, i was about to ask the uh, the technical and legal aspects of it uh, you know if that's okay uh, how do you you yeah. know kick start uh, such a consultancy or you know how do you find clients and build contacts say someone like me wants to create and run a you know consultancy like this what would be my step by step process and how do i run it okay yeah i mean See, the thing is, it's pretty simple uh, so far. I mean, all you have to do is first, like, you can get a, like, a GST ID and you mm -hmm. have a GST number and now you're officially a business, okay? You're yeah. a, a sole proprietor of a business and you are that business and you can get to work. You can start uh, raising invoices with GST, blah, blah, blah. And you can start in fact you don't even need that like you don't need i think there's a certain threshold uh of payment after which you need a gst uh number but i think mm -hmm. below that i don't think you even need that in india there are fewer rules about these things uh, which is a good and bad thing <laughs> uh but uh it, it, it's pretty easy to get started in terms mm -hmm. of prophecy uh we're still kind of um exploring what are so there are a lot of different kind of business um company registrations and things like that that uh that are beneficial that again have like its benefits and its its pitfalls um one is there is a way in which like i mentioned like if everyone is a co-owner and everyone is a partner then every time someone new joins you have to re-register the company and on the papers the new person's uh, name is on it. So every time someone new, new joins, the company is registered again. Uh, so that's a certain kind of uh, company registration that you can do. I think it's called an LLP, uh, Limited Liability Partnership. Mm -hmm. Then there is Limited Liability Corporation, I think is LLC. That's the mm -hmm. one where you have like on paper, you officially need a CEO. Uh, but like internally, you can figure out that the equity is equally distributed or whatever. Um, the equity of the company is distributed. And then every time someone new joins, the existing partners kind of split the their equity to make the new person get the equal amount, whatever. But on paper, there's still a CEO. So we're still kind of exploring which, which ones are meaningful for us. Uh, because like I said, there are benefits uh, and, and, you know, it falls about all the different kinds of models. Uh, at the moment, we're just like, like I said, it's been less than a year where we've all been like actively working together. In fact, uh, so far, the projects that we've done have been independent. Like I've been running a brand project separately and uh, Siddharth and Akshay have been running another project. So we're still kind of figuring out what it's like to work together. Uh, mm -hmm. what it's like to work like this is my first experience working independently I've only worked in in companies before so there's a lot of learning for me there in terms of like how to uh, how to communicate with clients how to uh, uh, how to you know run projects how to manage workshops how to do research a lot of different things so rather than um, like kind of fixing a lot of these um, these operational aspects we're still being quite experimental and flexible and to, to try to explore what are the possibilities uh before we kind of narrow down and we're like okay this is what we're doing or things like that there are certain values and um ideas that we hold 
uh, very important. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we are very flexible and kind of experimental about. So, um, yeah, so we're figuring these things out as we as we go along. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing it, Sneha. Uh, let's talk about tip top type tips. Man, that's a tongue twister. Okay. What, what was your intention, uh, you know, behind writing a newsletter? What did you learn about building an email list and marketing by doing this? Yeah, so I started the newsletter a long back. I started it four years ago in 2018. Um, I actually just started writing. Uh, so I've always, like I mentioned before, I've always loved lettering and typography. I've enjoyed like browsing type foundry, like websites, uh, like, you know, other collections of type and things like that. Um, and it's just something that I find very, one, enjoyable and two, it's it's something that's very core cool to like visual design. It's a very, very important aspect of the, the skill set that you have as a visual or a graphic designer. Um, typography is one of those things that if you get like if you have a stronghold on uh it can really it can improve your designs like by a long shot like there's a lot of other things that you could afford to be lazy about but typography if you have you know things in order uh it can help a lot uh it can really make a big difference so that's how that's what I kind of experienced first time when I was at NID. I was like, I already really enjoyed type, but the more I kind of spent time with it, I realized that this is like a, a advantage, like a like an extra advantage that you can have. If you become really good at this, you can be a really, as they say, 10x designer, okay? Uh, yeah. But uh, so, so and, and uh, another thing that I discovered uh, early on from like a lot of my friends who are also designers is that it's extremely typography is a little hard to get uh, into like um, it can be it's pretty gate like it can be kind of gatekeepy and uh, it's quite it's full of jargon uh, it can get a little complex it can get overly technical or overly simplified there's just like it kind of exists in these extremes so what would happen often is that a lot of my friends uh, uh, like design friends would come to me for advice on on typographic choices or to kind of get my feedback on certain uh, typographic decisions that they've made or they would be like oh I found this font somewhere can you tell me what font this is stuff like that uh, they would just ask a lot of these kinds of questions so uh, I felt like okay as a joke almost I started this newsletter I call it tip top type tips and I created like a PDF and I shared it with with some friends of mine uh, as an email attachment. I didn't know how to like code a newsletter. I didn't know any of that. I just shared it with a few friends and I wanted to keep it really simple. Uh, just keep it like um, like everything that you need to consume in the newsletter is in the newsletter content itself. Uh, there might be additional links for people who really want to deep dive, but for the average reader, everything that is in that particular issue of the newsletter is available there itself. It could be, you can complete it in, in, in a single sitting, right? Um, so that was the idea. Uh, then as, so I sent it to my friends, they really, they gave me some feedback about it. Uh, then I realized that this might be a good idea. So, so I learned how to, you know, I learned some HTML code uh, to be able to code this newsletter. I use some tools available online. Uh, and uh, yeah, I sent out my first newsletter in 2018. And since then, excuse me, uh, since then I have um, sent out quite a few newsletters. I go like, I'm not, it's quite irregular because uh, yeah, with all of the other things that uh, that I, I, I keep getting involved in, I have a bit of shiny object syndrome. Uh, so things get uh, the newsletter sometimes loses some of my attention, uh, but it's really it's really enjoyable. I I really enjoy curating the things that I read. So these are the cool thing about the newsletter is that everything that I share as part of it is stuff that I find and read anyway. 
I just kind of package it in a way that I think would be useful or interesting for other people who are curious uh, like me to read. So the and the the audience or the specific kind of person that this is targeted to is somewhere in between like and it's not for experts uh, because I'm not an expert myself. So I don't curate it for like people who know about uh, typography and all of the details already. Uh, and it's not also cu uh, curated for complete newbies. It's curated kind of like for the in-between person, people who are enthusiasts, people who are curious about design and typography, people who um, who know that it would be useful to help them level up uh yeah. and, and it, it the idea is just to kind of get you get you started uh like a certain article might uh trigger a certain idea or uh take you through like a rabbit hole of a certain of, of you know many different uh um maybe i maybe i directed you to a certain foundry today and then you go to that foundry and you go down a rabbit hole of like their entire collection of 100 typefaces that they've designed or something like that and that allows you to improve your collection uh, of typefaces stuff like that where all of this stuff is already available uh, online but i just kind of put it together in a way that i think that people would uh, find useful um there are some other excellent uh, typography newsletters uh, online um that you know collect that share new fonts, uh, this one called Fresh Fonts. Uh, they just, you know, curate new fonts that are being designed. Uh, so, and then there's another one which gets, I think it's called, uh, I don't remember what it's called. Um, yeah, I'll share that with you after. Uh, but the idea is that I didn't, like both of these audiences were very different. I wanted to keep mine really simple, just three, three uh you know tips per per issue so one is usually like some kind of a deep dive uh some specific you know idea or concept one is a new like a font recommendation or like a new font that i found or something like that and the last is usually some kind of game or some interesting uh thing that is type adjacent yeah all right Thanks for doing that. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we have one last question in this segment. Uh, let's talk about brand experience. Can you define brand experience design for me? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I've already kind of defined it uh, through our conversation so far in, in, yeah. in some ways. The idea is just that, like, the, like I mentioned before, it's that how can you think about designing now a lot of the the products that we have in the world a lot of the brands that we're designing uh are for digital products uh not all but like the the bulk of my work is focused on uh designing for digital products and services uh so or let's say internet products and services so the idea is that how can we how can we create a more brand conscious approach of designing products and how can we ensure that the product and brand experience is not, they're not separate from each other and it feels seamless and consistent and well-rounded. So that's okay. the idea. The idea is that uh, there is, uh, there are these few different departments, brand, marketing, sales, so like customer service, product, blah, blah, blah. And all of these teams kind of have to come together to create a really, really good brand experience because how the customer service person uh, answers a query is just as important as the social media campaign that you put out. It's just as important as the onboarding experience in your, in your app. And all of these things uh, should be led by the brand voice that you have and the, the uh, overall brand uh, values and, and the strategy that you have for your brand. Um, so I'm trying to basically through brand experience, figure out how to bring these teams together, how to bring these, um, uh, different departments, uh, to, together to kind of create a very cohesive, uh, 
brand experience for the end user yeah yeah thanks for clarifying that when you say when you teach brand experience uh, with 10k designers right so can you give a gist of uh, what all you talk about like topics yeah, specific topics sure. and, yeah yeah sure. uh, so so we've had just one uh, edition of the of the cohort um, of the program so far and mm-hmm. kind of in the process of working on the second iteration of that uh, there are a few things that i want to kind of change up and improve uh, from my mm-hmm. learnings uh, of the first uh, edition but i talk about i'll tell you about how the first program went so in the first program we started out like so it was 12 weeks uh, and it was kind of divided into four modules and the first uh, module was about um, designing about the fundamentals of design so figuring out all of the visual design aspects uh, uh, like typography color um, composition things like that then the uh, yeah then the other what the second is about so first is about like design skills itself second is about being a designer so being a designer encompasses the skills that you require as a designer uh, to do your work well so that is like giving and receiving feedback uh, how to collaborate well how to um, create good processes what should the design process look like uh, about storytelling how do you use you know uh, storytelling to improve your practice and things like that <clears throat> the third the third module is about all of the all of the design adjacent uh, aspects so like like we discussed like business fundamentals for designers what are the things that you that is good to know as as a designer that will help you work with business people better what are things about product that are good to know that will help you work, work with product teams better so learning mm-hmm. about all of these adjacent things because it helps you do your work as a designer even better and the last mm-hmm. is about like uh, is not was not necessarily to do with design but to do with like um how like about like negotiation about uh, about being a creator about learning like no code tools to kind of improve your existing skill set as a designer how can you mm-hmm. um think about design outside of just design but as like creation uh and uh, like as a creative profession what are some of the things that you can add as part of your practice uh then mm-hmm. of course talking about money talking about um yeah a lot of these things that are not design but are more about the the um experience of living in this world as a designer uh so yeah so that's broadly how the the program uh was kind of split so some of the areas that we really focused on was like like i said like design skills uh storytelling and uh the all of the design adjacent stuff so about like collaboration about being a designer but also some of the more soft aspects of it uh yeah fine right. interviewing things like that all right let's get into the next segment where we talk about metaverse nfts etc you know before we jump into detailed questions and answers right i just wanted to do a rapid fire round about the metaverse with you is that fine okay fine i'll do my best all right all right you know you should make the answers as short and simple as possible um, sure. what is metaverse it's like the virtual world but in 3d mm-hmm. what is cryptocurrency cryptocurrency is a form of digital decentralized uh, money that uses blockchain technology to to function yeah okay what is a blockchain blockchain essentially uh is like a, a collection of many many different servers around the world that mm-hmm. are it they like bookkeeping but there's no centralized uh source of truth but the fact that all of these servers hold the same information uh proves that the other one is also telling the truth uh so and and, and it that's how it's decentralized yeah i'm answering yeah this is something you answers and as what yeah. what is web3 uh web3 is a new is like the 
I would say like the latest iteration of the internet where mm. uh, things are composable. So there's like three important things in Web3. One is things are composable, meaning that the code allows for you to, uh, you can kind of write, use that code and, and build on top of that. Think about the code like Lego blocks. So you can remix it, you can add on top of it, you can edit it, things like that and create new versions. So like, in web 2 for example if you take facebook you can't make a version of facebook on top of facebook because facebook is not giving you access to their code but in mm -hmm. web 3 it, the code is composable uh, then you can so by that logic you can read the code you can write on top of the code but you can also own a piece of code you can own something on the internet mm -hmm. uh, yeah so those are two important things uh, the other is that most things are uh, open source in, in Web3 because the more composable it is, the more useful uh, it becomes uh, in Web3. And by that logic, keeping things open source is more beneficial. So, yeah, I would say these are some of the... And, of course, uh, money, uh, currency, like actual money is a native... Uh, part of the of the the code itself it's not mm -hmm. it's not like you have to add a payment gateway in web 2 if you want to add any kind of money aspect to it you have to add a payment gateway like stripe or raise a pay or whatever but uh, in web 3 money is part of the code uh, mm -hmm. so any decision any action that is happening on the blockchain requires you to expel a certain amount of money and like there's everything is happening with with money so yeah okay. so it changes how we think about the internet about uh about sharing collaborating and about economics so a lot of these different things are at play about ownership about open source and about um uh, the economy uh it's the kind of coming together of many of these things and technology obviously yeah all right what is nft NFT is a kind is, I mean, it's non fungible token, but essentially it is that like, if you take any two like notes, rupee notes, um, they can be exchanged, uh, and they would have the same value. Uh, but an NFT means that, uh, but if I give you like, uh, if I give you a photograph, a photograph of like my cats and you give me like a photograph of like your dog they are not the same uh they are non-fungible one does not replace the other in fact even if you give me another photograph of my cats they are not they are not exchangeable uh they are not fungible meaning they are not uh, one can't be replaced they are not equal in in its uh in its identity uh so so non-fungible tokens essentially there are it doesn't mean that there's only one in the world there could be multiple versions of that same one thing, but there's only that many of the th those things as is written in the code. So if the code mm -hmm. says that there are only 10 variation, 10 versions of this NFT, there are only 10. And sure, you can screenshot that, but that is not the, it does not have the same connection to the code and therefore mm -hmm. does not have the same, uh, you can't track it back to the blockchain in the same way that you can track the actual NFT. So, um, okay, that is All the right. technical okay. meaning of that. Is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what all can be NFTs apart from digital art? A lot of music. There are a lot of these extremely new, uh, interesting music projects uh, in the NFT space that I'm quite uh, interested uh, and curious about. So like any combination of like certain kinds of notes or a tune or anything can is unique and can be an NFT similar to digital like visual art. I also think that there is a lot of there's a lot of value in uh, typefaces and NFTs kind of coming together. Um, so basically what I think is that the entire any industry or any good or asset that uses licensing as a model, uh, as a business model, could benefit a lot from NFTs because mm -hmm. you can essentially track the, the, 
the usage of that thing because all of those actions are on the blockchain. So for example, if I buy a typeface as an NFT uh, and I use it on a certain website, that information of me and the website is all on the blockchain. And now mm-hmm. if I like, I can't, if I buy it, I can't buy a pirated version of it because I have to get it from the blockchain. Maybe if there is a pirated version of it, but it's not on the blockchain, then there is some way of kind of tracking that or whatever. And another cool thing that you can do is you can kind of add to the code that every time a sale is made or every time someone kind of detaches this particular, um, you know, typeface, like the file, the font file, um, then there's a certain licensing fee that goes to the original uh, creator of the typeface and things like that. So, I mean, that's just an, a th- something that I've been thinking about recently that mm-hmm. I think that these worlds might have a lot of, I don't think everything needs to be an NFT, but there are some, there are some kinds of uh, domains, like some spaces that would benefit a lot from the technology that NFT uh, NFT like NFT technology allows for. I think that yeah. like fonts is one one way that could be quite could be quite interesting. I'm I'm sure that there are other gaps that I don't know about, but like off the top of my head, uh, it seems like a good idea. Yeah, one thing I'm looking forward to is that when people get patents and you know draft them as kind of thing. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. So again, it's licensing, right? So any industry yeah. that that uses licensing would it makes sense. It seems like a natural progression. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are smart contracts? Smart contracts are basically like they're the 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 code that is the they're just like contracts except that they are using code and mm-hmm. all of the instructions about what is to happen when this happens and when that happens, just like a normal code is written, but smart contracts are usually they're immutable. What I mean by immutable is that you sh- you can't go back and edit them. Uh, mm-hmm. You can't. They can't be. Uh, they can't be deleted. So it take the two things: take regular code and take contracts. And if you bring them together, uh, what are the what are the things that are important attributes of those two things? Like contracts, it is binding. Uh, so it is it is not. It is not a contract between two people. It is a contract in the code. The code is mm-hmm. the source of truth. Uh, and is, so that makes it immutable. And uh, it is also, it is like a like an automated action. Like no one has to control it to say, do this. But it's like the code already has instructions to say that when this happens, this happens. Or if this doesn't happen, then this, this doesn't happen. So simple things like, for example, if you go to, if you booked a hotel and uh, uh, let's say there was a smart contract that said that as soon as you open the keys of the, I mean, you open the door of the uh, room with your keys, that's exactly when the smart contract uh, takes money from your wallet and moves it to the hotel wallet. Till that point, the money is still in your wallet. But let's say when this action happens, there's no human intervention required. But the smart contract knows that this action triggers this action and it's all happening uh, through uh, the blockchain without any uh, human intervention that requires any kind of uh, middleman. That's crazy. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so, again, know, there uh, are like those, uh, there are benefits, uh, like there are some industries that could benefit from it. Some, I mm-hmm. don't know. Uh, but... Uh, but yeah, simple things like in NFTs, for example, it's just that like when I pay this amount, it immediately transfers the ownership to me and that entire transaction, all of the information of that transaction is happening through that smart contract and mm-hmm. it is available as information publicly to everybody um, that is written into the smart contract. No one can okay. dispute that. So if if, uh, if an NFT co- uh, costs $1 million, if I pay the one million dollars, you can't deny me that the ownership of that NFT. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's some good things in it, like uh, it allows for uh, actions to be very straightforward. But 
mm-hmm. I imagine that there are cases where you need much more nuance and mm-hmm. much more uh, like subjective evaluation that NFTs might not allow for. Uh, not NFTs, sorry, smart contracts. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So, you know, going forward, you can give detailed answers. We are done with that. And uh, okay. oh, let's, let's, okay. let's, let's talk about V3, you know, which I read as a design collective building the Web3. So it, it's pretty interesting and uh, it's kind of amazing that, you know, I could also see that it's backed by IDEO Collab, Delphi Labs and a couple of other funding support institutions, right? So what's the story behind it? V3 is basically a design DAO uh, or a design collective. Uh, DAO is basically decentralized autonomous organization. So similar to how I described prophecy, uh, where it's a collective and everyone is, has shared ownership and, and kind of shared governance and decision making. Uh, but if all of that was again on the blockchain and it didn't require people to make these decisions, but it's happening. Like, so if you do a certain project, you get payout. Um, this is like how much you get paid because it's part of the smart contract or like these many hours equals to these many pay or like things like that. All of this information is not happening. Uh, this, this, uh, like you raise an invoice, you take three weeks to reply, then you pay me the money. These things are not happening, um, at a human like level, but, uh, but they're happening on the, the blockchain itself. Um, that's how like DAOs should function. Nowadays, I mean, a lot of DAOs are still kind of figuring out what are the best uh, models and the best uh, methods to make this happen. So it's more about the philosophy of DAOs and and the the uh, ideology of decentralization. But in practice, this pro- the processes are still kind of centralized and still kind of uh, managed by people because many of these decisions. See, once you decentralize an organization. Uh, that's forever. Like you can't bring it back to being centralized. So many yeah. uh, DAOs uh, and many organizations in the Web3 space stay centralized till they're able to figure out what is the best version of their decentralized model. Like what is the best way to mm. do it? Like have they yeah. figured out all of the possible loopholes? Uh, because once you distribute it, then every decision that you made will be made with everyone's consensus with like proper governance processes and stuff. And as much as that sounds great, it sounds very de- democratic and, uh, you know, good, but they're much slower. Uh, there can be decisions that are made poorly. Uh, there's less, uh, there's less knowledge and insight about the vision or things like that. That means that people may not know what they're making decisions about things like that. So about coming back to V3, V3 uh, basically is a design collective uh, that I came across a few months back. So when I was just kind of getting um, introduced and acquainted with the uh, Web3 space and I was becoming quite uh, interested in designing uh, brands for Web3, uh, I came across uh, this designer, her name is Charlotta, and she used to work at IDEO before. And now she is one of the, uh, like the early members and founders of V3. So I came across, I kind of reached out to her and then she mentioned V3 and I, uh, joined the collective and basically, uh, there are a lot of projects in the web three space that get, uh, it runs like consultancy and like, a like you would imagine any, uh, design organization or agency or whatever to run. And they kind of take on projects uh, in the space and people reach out to V3 uh, for, let's say, either very, very long term, like in-depth involvement to figure out what the product is, to figure out like the entire strategy for the product and brand or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And the people who are involved in that project, they get paid uh, through in in cryptocurrency. of like either like stable coins, stable coins are like USDC. USDC is like USD coin. And uh, it's basically, it's pegged against the US dollar. So it's just the same as the US dollar, but on the on the uh, blockchain. So uh, people get either paid in, in USDC or you can get paid in like 
uh, their own token, V3 token. And essentially, um, the idea with these DAOs are that they create their own tokens. Uh, and these tokens are like a collection of a lot of different tokens of the projects that they're working on. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's say they're working on a project with uh, with uh, with Terra or like with Uniswap or something like that. So they have some Uniswap tokens, they have some Terra tokens, they have some Aave tokens, they have a lot of these different tokens. And the, to the price of these tokens will keep going up and down. But because mm -hmm. they have one token, which is a collection of these, that token gets indexed against a lot of these different tokens. So uh, if you are an owner of a V3 token, if one of those the tokens that it, it that it contains goes if they are succeeding then the v3 token obviously its value increases as well mm -hmm. stuff like that so uh so yeah so right now there uh so i worked on one project with them uh bef just like a few months back and there's another project that i will start working on with them uh soon um mm -hmm. yeah similarly there's another dao design dao that i'm also part of called vector dao which also has, again, a similar kind of notion, but much more equity focus. So uh, we treat as a combination of cash and equity with the with the clients that we work with. But mm -hmm. uh, VectorDAO was kind of started out by this idea of like, um, as designers, like we get really involved and we define a lot of the, the product and the company and, you know, the business and everything. But most of the time you get paid uh, in cash and you don't get paid in skin in the game sometimes you get paid in esops but uh, very rarely do you get to be like an investor in the in the company that you put sweat equity into so yeah. um so the idea with vector was that the project that they work on they get equity in those projects in the form of tokens or in the form of the nfts that they have or whatever and in exchange uh, Vector DAO has a collection, like has a uh, a group of designers, and mm -hmm. designers can kind of work on projects based on availability, based on skills, things like that. And mm -hmm. every person on the project, the person who brings the client, the person who leads the project, the person who works on the brand, the person who works on the product, whatever, uh, all of them kind of they split the split the pool of uh that project uh budget and they kind of they they accordingly get paid in again in like in tokens uh okay and again those tokens are pegged against certain equity in that in that particular company so they vetted out as it in the form of seasons so mm -hmm. everyone who works on a project so maybe there are five projects in a season and mm -hmm. everyone who works on a certain project in that season gets equity from all the projects in that season um, okay. yeah and so on and and v3 is again similar but not uh not yet in, as seasons but more um as a collective token itself okay i hope that is all not right. too uh in depth <laughs> yeah <laughs> but there's a lot to take away from this thanks for sharing the insight and uh, let's say a young creator wants to design for web3 right so how should he or she start Give us a you know a step by step process. Uh, see, I think again, uh, like many other things in the world, uh, the thing with Web three is that it's an extremely fast moving, um, kind of. It can be kind of overwhelming the space, and yeah, the thing that is the most to your advantage is time. So if you are like someone who's studying, who has a lot of free time on their hands, you don't have a lot of project work or you don't have a lot of assignment work and things like that. The biggest advantage that you have is access to your own time. People with full-time jobs cannot keep up with what's happening in Web3 because uh, they don't have the luxury of time. Having a full-time job is ex exhausting. Um, yeah. And uh, like it's a big privilege to, after the end of a work day, then, you know, take on like, project in web3 really quite uh, intense so if you have time i would say try to become as familiar as possible with a lot of the uh, vocabulary and a lot of the general mental models of the space uh, simple you don't have to get really in, into like 
like I explained the the question, the rapid fire, the questions that you asked, none of my none of my answers were proper definitions. I'm sure a lot of those were flawed, but I understand it enough to know what I'm dealing with uh, without being clueless. But I would not say I'm an expert in terms of the technology itself. Uh, so try to understand uh, like about the space itself, uh, the the what is going on, like what are these terms, what do they mean, blah, blah, blah. Then I think that as a designer, uh, the skills that you can that you have, right? If you know how to build uh, websites on Webflow, super useful skill. Try to find projects that that require just web design and Webflow building. There are a lot of projects that you can just find via Twitter, uh, via like other uh, Discord servers and things like that. So mm-hmm. the cool thing about Web three, unlike conventionally, how you might find a freelance project and things like that is that web three is kind of like do it first and ask later. Uh, so if you have a certain idea, let's say that there's a new project that you are seeing, or like there's a new company in the web three space that you think you could design a really great like website or logo for. I've seen this so many times that people go ahead and do it. They design the website, they design the logo, whatever, and they share it online or they share it in the Discord server. They share it with the the founder of that particular uh, Web3 company. And those founders or those people are more than willing to pay them, compensate them for it or hire them full time or have them be like a contributor and things like that. So I would say that uh, don't get too caught up in figuring out uh what to do but more like do something and see uh like kind of learn from that and then go from there Mm -hmm. so if there's something that you want to do i don't think anyone is stopping you from actually doing it so unlike uh unlike in the in the previous way in which things used to work like you don't have to get a lot of permission to do things you don't have to go through a lot of different contracts and like you know stuff like that you just can kind of get involved immediately you can just make a contribution show it to people publish it share it make it open source uh and and uh, usually people are very happy about it uh people are very willing to kind of get you on board in a much more um legitimate capacity uh so yeah so i would say that that is a good way to to get involved. Um, mm-hmm. Lots of lots of different DAOs, lots of different Web three companies are looking for design contributors to design. Uh, you know, anything it could be like a poster for Twitter Space. It could be a website. It could be a logo. It could be blog post header. It could be a lot of different things. Uh, maybe some app screens, whatever. Just go ahead and design it. Like no need to ask for too much permission. Uh, there are also lots of design bounties. Bounties are essentially like freelance projects, but again, they're working. They use a smart contract. So if you submit a bounty, uh, you get paid for it. It's very simple. There's no like no uh, nonsense in between. So find a lot of there are a lot of design bounties that you can uh, get. You know, get involved in. Um, yeah. So I would say these are some ways that you can kind of get involved immediately. All right. Thanks for the answer, Sneha. Um, you know what? I have. I initially had a couple of other questions uh, with the metaverse, but you pretty much covered everything. You know? So enough about NFTs and the metaverse. You know? Let's move on to the regular non-confusing stuff about being a designer. All right. So sure. <laughs> you have been with companies like um, An Academy, Ola, et cetera, right? And you have headed design for entities like Graphy from An Academy what you did set and drive you brand experiences. What would you consider to be your learnings from being a designer in tech firms? Um, one is surely that like, at least in early to like mid state startups, which is what I have usually, like I've worked in most of the time, things move very mm-hmm. fast and there's a certain, uh, rigidity in terms of process that we kind of come with especially when you come from design school um you expect things to be a certain kind of way because that's how you learn that it should be but 
but in reality things happen a lot more ad hoc um so that adaptability and flexibility that uh, that you require to be in a tech startup is is quite essential to helping you thrive um i also think that the thing that is the most like most liberating and most important thing that i have taken away is that similar to what i mentioned in the web3 space which is that in tech startups usually people are not going to tell you not to do something people are going to people are not going to know what you can offer them that's almost guaranteed uh, so if you say for example that i think we should start a hackathon uh and i think that i think we should start a design hackathon it will be good for us to hire designers uh people won't say no but people won't be thrilled about it either they'll just be like we have other priorities or uh you know there are other things that i would much rather you work on but if yeah. somehow you are able to you are able to actually you are able to action it you are able to do it and prove it like you actually build a website you design it and you just share it you be like i thought we should have a design hackathon look what i've made tell me what you think can you give me feedback on this what do you think about it mm-hmm. most of the time my experience has been that people are extremely excited about initiative and the more initiative you take the more opportunities you create for yourself so it's more about making opportunities than it is about asking for permission uh and very few people will tell you what they expect from you but you can prove to them what they should expect from you or what more they can expect from you um that mm-hmm. has been like my experience uh, working again mine is very limited to the places that i have worked at uh, so that's the caveat but um, but yeah that that has been uh, some important things and the third thing is definitely that most of the time uh, like 90% of the time i'm not working with other designers Uh, okay. I have had to learn and unlearn a lot of things about uh, how I talk about my work, or how I am able to collaborate with other people, um, so that it is meaningful and valuable to them. Uh, mm-hmm. Simple things like, as a designer, we always expect we we have this idea of a brief. We expect a brief to be a certain kind of way. people write most of the time people write awful briefs uh people don't know how to write good briefs people don't know what yeah. it should contain and then the then if you go back and ask them a lot of questions they'd be like why are you asking so many questions so you have to start from why it's important for you to know the answers to these questions you have to tell them okay but if you tell me who we are designing this thing for it will help me design this like focus with that particular audience in mind if you tell me what medium this thing is going to be in if we're going to print it as a billboard it will influence the way in which i this approach this design or like whatever you know things like that so small things like that i feel like you have to kind of educate as well as uh advocate at the same time you know advocate and educate at the same time because people very few people have the experience of working with other designers in a way that uh you expect them to most of the time mm-hmm. uh they just there's a certain uh, bias with which they come in and this bias with which we come in and you really have to be patient to kind of uh find that really good sweet spot where you show them that hey this is how i can help you and then they're like oh my god i had no idea that designers could help me in this way and then once you do that then it becomes a much more collaborative and smooth process so uh this 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 idea of like collaborating really closely involving inviting non designers into your process uh getting you know and, and designers usually hate that designers usually hate the idea of getting other people like inviting other people into their figma file and kind of having them lurk around while you're still making things it feels kind of uh, threatening 
but it becomes important when you work in an environment where other people are not designers because you want them to build empathy for the kind of thinking that you do uh you want them to give you feedback in a way that is not designed feedback but is feedback about what they know well because there is a certain expertise that they're bringing to the to the table that you don't have as a designer so you want that as much as possible because at the end of the day like we're trying to do this together so yeah uh, yeah so that's really important so those three things uh, yeah what was your biggest fear when you started as a designer you know before you got into dealing with people and all these things i think that if i had to think of the biggest fear i would think like i want to always kind of have a very uh, learning attitude about like my practice and about like my skills and what i bring to the i don't want to reach a point where uh, i'm not relevant anymore uh, not just in terms of skill but even in terms of my thinking or my mindset uh, uh yeah it's a fear i i still hold it's just that i always kind of want to uh, keep learning i want to have the ability to keep learning like it can be exhausting to keep mm-hmm. refreshing your uh, your ideologies or things that you know but and like like we just spoke about like things are changing and evolving and new things are coming all the time um mm-hmm. and and i don't i don't think it's important to have all the skills but i think it's important to be open and be kind of uh yeah accepting that like there's a lot of things that you know and there's a lot of things that you don't know and it's really okay to uh get other people involved uh in things that you don't know and kind of fill in your own gaps but also be confident about the things that you know well and uh kind of contribute in those places so staying really having this uh active uh learning mindset and and, and this this ability to want to stay relevant stay fresh stay uh less biased uh yeah those are those are some of fears that i hold yeah till today you know based on the entire conversation right i could notice that if you have been working on so many things at once how do you multitask how do you manage your time and how do you focus on things it would be amazing okay. if at all you have a framework or something which you follow like blocking your time on working on projects something like that it would be amazing to know i really don't think i'm i'm the right person to give advice on time management <laughs> because i don't think i manage my time i definitely okay. like i mentioned before i have like shiny objects in room uh i get excited about a lot of different things i want to learn new things um i'm like reading about a lot of things that i find interesting uh i there's a lot of project fomo that i have like i i i'm working on something but i'm excited to work on the next thing there is new thing that i want to do or learn like it happens all the time and honestly my philosophy on that is that i have the energy and the inclination to want to do that today and i don't know how long i will have that i, I think it's a natural uh, thing to happen that like as you as you grow old you get like more complacent and i mean it's yeah. not a bad thing i'm not saying it like a bad thing but there's a certain amount there's a hunger that you uh that you kind of satiate as you as you grow older you're just kind you feel more and more content uh yeah. i would not say i'm a discontent person right now i just think i'm a little uh i'm a little like i'm very hungry and mm-hmm. uh, yeah and i and i'm very uh fascinated by a lot of it very curious about a lot of different things so i take i use my time uh goes where like i my i want my i want to focus my energy it's more about like if i find something to not be uh interesting or uh like comparatively in like my world of things that i want to kind of focus my energy on at a certain period in time uh i kind of prioritize accordingly where i'm just like it's okay to to say no to something now hoping that maybe it will come back to me in a different way some other time i try mm-hmm. to not be regretful or resentful about it 
I, I don't, I haven't experienced that so much uh, uh, so far, thankfully. But uh, I'm not very good at time management. I work a lot uh, and it's not a very good thing. Like, uh, I don't glamorize it at all. Uh, and, and like in the sense that I should be working much less. The thing is, I really, really, I justify that by saying that I enjoy working. Like, I really enjoy doing what I'm doing. So it's okay. But it's not okay. Like, let's be honest. It's not okay to work so much. You should spend more time with, like, yeah. your friends and family and doing other things. Uh, I don't do a very good job at uh, uh, that as much as I'd like. Uh, hopefully, I will have some kind of uh, framework for managing my time better at some point but at the moment i don't think uh, i don't think i i know how to do it myself let alone uh, give advice to other people uh, yeah but yeah my justification to that is that like my hunger is is likely limited so and you know you you talked a lot about the business side of design right uh, mm-hmm. so how important do you think are the designers in the real world especially when we see things like what's happening between russia and ukraine currently right how do you how do you think designers will be of uh, relevance when things keep changing uh, i don't know uh, like i think sometimes the problem with designers at least in my experience so far is that because it's a creative profession we kind of we kind of tend to create like our entire personality and our entire life around being a designer so like uh how we choose to like design our house how we choose to design our life how we choose to do our work everything is like we think is like part of being a designer but i do do think that there's a lot of importance and and merit in 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 just being like a human being and like not being a designer like for yeah. example if there's like if there's a war happening if there's like people are being uh you know evacuated from their homes and like this bombs happening maybe we don't have to think like a designer and make posters about it maybe it's more meaningful to like donate money uh maybe it's more meaningful to uh to like actually help people in their immediate surroundings that you can and things like that so i don't think that everything needs a design solution because that's the skills we have those are the skills we have as designers right uh yeah i have been like I, I I kind of uh, been I've done this especially as a young designer I feel like it happens a lot of times and I've done this as well where I'm just like something is happening in the world my way to cope with it my way to to kind of handle it is to do what I know best is to design but like it's really really unhelpful sometimes uh, it does not help at all uh, yeah so simple things like we recently had Women's Day right. Uh, women's day has become like this capitalistic like monster of a day like it's it's just like there was just that day was so insane i don't know when this has happened it's like now women's day is like christmas like there's like discounts everywhere every every website every person everyone on the online and offline is trying to sell you something as it is i mean as a woman and like it's simple like we just forgot that like what is women's day actually about it's just about like remembering like that that women are disenfranchised and uh we we need to make a world that is more equitable to women simple like it's really that simple but like we found a capitalistic way to kind of handle everything so as designers sometimes when women's day is going on we're like let's make a poster like let's make this more film about the women in my life or something like that i don't think it's my opinion is that like i don't think it's required i really think that you can make a much bigger impact as a human being than as a designer and like everything we do in our life doesn't need to kind of uh circle around this idea of being a designer it's just the work that we do it's the profession that we have it's not the person that we are uh and 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 this is the funny thing is that if you compare this to other professions if you compare it to like an accountant or you compare it to a banker or even like 
an engineer or anything like that right they don't the entire life is not revolved around revolve around being an accountant it's not like every th- every action that they make every decision that we make is them thinking like a designer but because we're in the in the in the space of like creative professions and because there is this very there are, the lines are very blurred between like work and play because it kind of feels like i'm enjoying what i'm doing so it's play it's not really work so making a poster over the weekend for women's day is not work it's play and like i'm building my personal brand by doing it like all of these lines are extremely blurred but i think sometimes it's important to kind of step back and like critically think about why you're doing this and if it's necessary uh and what is something that you can do that might benefit much more like the example that you gave about the ward i think that like i've been thinking about this a lot like as someone in india who is just sitting so many like kilometers away it's really hard to you know because what's happening there could impact all of us in many different ways but simple things like a couple of my friends are in finland which is they share a border with russia and they're terrified like because they don't know what will happen uh and like if they might close the borders and things like that you simple thing you could just like check with your friends that's like some a small action that might have yeah. a much bigger impact to one or two people than like an instagram post that you might create that might have like many many impressions but may not actually amount to anything uh there are some occasions where communication communication design is important but i don't think that we should go in with that solution first it should be that is this problem does this require the solution or should i just stop thinking like a designer and kind of step back and think about what is actually required in 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 a situation yeah yeah that that makes total sense thanks for sharing that um Can you name some of your favorite designers and why? I always kind of had this policy growing up of not having heroes. Uh mm-hmm. like uh I just find uh, that to be quite a disappointing um yeah it's it's something that it's a disappointing path to be on. Either they will disappoint you or you will find some way to uh be disappointed in something that they do or say because we're like all human beings. So yeah. there are a lot of people's work that i really admire uh i really admire for example uh this this uh, this designer i worked with when i was uh, doing like my internship sanjit savaria i really admire his work he's uh, also from nid many years mm-hmm. senior to me uh his work is is brilliant uh there are some illustrators work i admire timo uh, uh i think i forgot his full name uh there's another designer adam ho whose work i really admire so these are people i really try to separate like i don't know them that well as individuals uh and i just see like the quality of their work and i think it's amazing and uh, oh i only named men maybe i sh- i should uh, i i feel bad about that i you know this uh, susan car uh, the the illustrator who designed a lot of the initial apple icons and illustrations i really like her work um i really enjoy kriti monga's lettering work uh her work is really amazing i really like right. the work that they do at cash app i love all the designers mm-hmm. work at cash app at blocks uh yeah i'm a big fan of their work yeah all right thanks for sharing that you know as a final thought uh do you want to suggest any content that you think might be helpful to the listeners it can be a book or a podcast or a documentary anything good question i would i would suggest watching as much content and reading as much outside of design as possible i think more designers should read fiction i don't read very much unfortunately from when i was young i never had and this has nothing to do with tv or the internet i just very did not have the ability to read very much but i really really wish i did um i if if i did i would highly recommend designers spend more time reading fiction 
uh, than uh, you know self help books or like non fiction uh, they can kind of get you in a loop of like do this do that then this will happen but fiction allows you it opens up your mind it allows you to think a really wide and it can really uh, it can really help kind of affect your uh, your abilities and your thinking as a designer so reading a lot of non fiction watching a lot of i really like watching a lot of animated films to kind of appreciate like the storytelling um uh, the decision making involved uh in in those films um uh, as far as non fiction goes uh this is book called uh, the politics of design uh, i highly recommend uh, people read that um it's by this author called one minute he also wrote this other book called uh, caps lock uh, mm-hmm. that's also a really good book uh, politics of yeah ruben patter uh, okay. yeah so he's both of these books are pretty good caps lock i haven't read yet but i've heard very good things about it um yeah i think those are some books that i would recommend films movies uh, as far as design goes the helvetica documentary is amazing it's a classic uh yeah I recommend that but yeah spend as much time away from design as possible it really helps it's kind of counterintuitive but if you spend more time away from design it actually helps your designs yeah get better helps you think better yeah of course of course yeah uh so yeah that marks the end of the questions i had in mind for you so um, the conversation has been like pretty insightful and fruitful and i learned a lot talking with you. it's been pretty amazing thank you shakti i think uh, your questions were very interesting uh you've done a lot of um, they're very like uh, specific to i think asking me about things that uh, you knew about me or were curious about what uh, might be good for me to talk about so thank you for doing that work and uh, i really enjoyed talking about these things uh, on a monday morning i feel like this has made me uh, excited for the rest of the week uh i <laughs> yeah this these kind of conversations are always great to kind of um, introspect about your like these are things that i don't actively like think about these are questions that like on a regular basis nobody asks me and i don't ask myself but when people mm-hmm. do ask um, it allows you to kind of clarify your own uh thinking and your own values and like things that you you care about and um yeah so yeah thank you for that uh, this is a really yeah. good chat i'm glad that we were able to do this and i'm really looking forward to uh, the other podcasts uh, the episodes in the in the series as well thank you thank you so much for joining us today sneha that's been a real honor to host you today